Good morning and welcome to the third lecture in bioenergetics for Bio 110. In this lecture we're going to cover the first part of aerobic respiration and that's going to be the citric acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle, it's going to be happening in the mitochondria. So let's have a moment to review the general structure of the mitochondria. The mitochondria, it is an organelle that is composed of two systems of membrane. You have an outer membrane and you have an inner membrane. The inner membrane is uh, architecture to have cristae, which are invaginations of the membrane designed to increase the surface area. Inside the inner membrane, the cytoplasm, quote unquote, of the mitochondria, you have an area called the matrix. Inside the matrix, you can find ribosomes, you can find the mitochondrial DNA, and other enzymes designed for mitochondrial function. The space in between the inner membrane and the outer membrane is called the intermembrane space, and that is going to be an area that later we're going to observe that has a high concentration of protons. Now, the citric acid cycle is going to occur within the matrix of the mitochondria, and later we're going to learn that the reactions of the electron transport chain are going to be located in the membrane of the inner portion of the mitochondria. Now, let's take a look at the combination of the glycolytic pathway as well as the citric acid cycle. Both of them are designed to generate ATP through substrate level phosphorylation. As we've mentioned in the previous lecture, glycolysis, which is going to be the uh, breaking of glucose into pyruvate, it's going to happen in the cytosol, and that is going to generate ATP through substrate level phosphorylation. After pyruvate gets transported across the mitochondria to the matrix of the organelle, we're going to have the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle and you also are going to generate ATP and also other high energy electron carriers like NAD plus and um, FADH2. Um, the ATP generated also in the Krebs cycle will be generated through substrate level phosphorylation. So let's look at how pyruvate would be transported across the membranes of the mitochondria into the matrix where it will eventually be decarboxylated and converted into acetyl-CoA. As we discussed earlier in class, the outer membrane of the mitochondria is not a permeability barrier because it contains porins that allow for the diffusion of pyruvate across the outer membrane. Now in the inner membrane space, pyruvate can be transported across the inner membrane into the matrix, where it will undergo three different reactions. One of the reactions will involve the decarboxylation of pyruvate into acetate. Another one will involve the um, reduction of NAD plus into NADH. And the last one will be the addition of coenzyme A to the acetate molecule to generate acetyl-CoA. Now, pyruvate made during glycolysis, it's converted to acetyl-CoA in the matrix of the mitochondria. And that happens through an enzyme complex called the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. This complex contains three enzymes. One enzyme is going to be pyruvate dehydrogenase, the other one dihydrolipoyl transacetylase, and the third dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase. So the very first reaction, it's going to be the decarboxylation of pyruvate into acetate by pyruvate dehydrogenase, shown here is enzyme 1. Enzyme 2 and enzyme 3 are going to have two simultaneous reactions, where the enzyme dihydrolipoyl transacetylase will be able to um, take the acetate molecule and add an acetyl-CoA and concomitantly you're going to have the reduction of NAD plus into NADH. This complex of the pyruvate dehydrogenase 
it organizes differently in gram-negative bacteria, and it is a multi-subunit complex involving 60 units with three functional proteins. In eukaryotes and gram-positive bacteria, it is actually organized as a dodecahedral symmetry containing 96 subunits. And all these enzymes, as I mentioned, are located within the matrix of the mitochondria in eukaryotes. They're actually present in the cytoplasm in prokaryotes. At the end, during the um, dihydrolipol transacetylase reaction, you generate a molecule of acetyl-CoA that has a very high energy thioester bond that could later be used to catalyze other reactions. Multiple molecules can come inside the cell to provide energy. So far, in the previous lecture, we learned how polysaccharides and sugars can be broken down into simple sugars that can be transported across the membrane of the cell. In the mem inside the cytoplasm, glucose will then on, uh, go through the process of glycolysis to generate pyruvate, and as we just discussed a moment ago, pyruvate can cross the membranes of the mitochondria to eventually become acetyl-CoA. But sugars are not the only energy source for the cell. Fats are also able to provide lots of energy, actually a lot more energy than uh, sugars. So a fat can be broken down into fatty acids and those fatty acids can then be brought inside the mitochondria where eventually each of them will be hydrolyzed to two carbon acetyl coal molecules and we're going to take a look at how the process is happening. A fat can generate a lot more energy than a sugar molecule because usually as you're aware a normal for example oleic acid uh, fatty acid containing 18 carbons um, it's going to be able to generate nine acetyl coa molecules versus a sugar like glucose is only able to provide two acetyl coa molecules so you have a lot greater generation of acetyl coa from fats so just take the number of carbons in the fatty acid molecule divide by two and that will be the number of acetyl coa molecules that you can obtain from a simple fatty acid as we discussed earlier in class fatty acids are are part of fats and one of the main uh, forms of fat storage is going to be triacylglycerol. Triacylglycerol, shown here on the right, has a glycerol molecule with an ester bond that is going to connect three fatty acids. During the energy metabolism, what you're going to have is a lipase enzyme that is going to be able to separate the fatty acid change from glycerol and therefore glycerol could be used as an energy source for the cell and the fatty acids could also be used as an energy source for the cell. So let's take a moment to understand how the metabolism of fatty acid is happening. What we have here on the top is a fatty acyl CoA molecule, basically an activated fatty acid that has been covalently bound by a thioester bond to the coenzyme A. Please pay attention to carbon 1, which is the carbonyl carbon, and carbon 2 adjacent to it. Those are marked in red. So the first thing that we're going to do is the uh, donation of an electron, of two electrons, excuse me, from the bond between carbon 1, carbon 2, excuse me, and carbon 3. That is going to those electrons will be accepted by FAD to generate an FADH2. And what you end up having is the generation of an alkene bond between the carbon 2 and carbon 3. So this double bond shown over here. So we went from having a single bond between carbon 2 and carbon 3, and now we have a double bond between carbon 2 and carbon 3. Now that those electrons have been donated, we can um, break down this bond to create a hydroxyl group by the utilization of a water molecule. So now again you will have a single bond between carbon 2 and carbon 3, but carbon 3 will now have a hydroxyl group attached to it, whereas before it only had a hydrogen. This carbon and oxygen can donate an electron to NAD plus to generate an NADH molecule and therefore now go from this hydroxyl group into a carbonyl group, as shown over here. 
the addition of another coenzyme A with a thiol uh, group to it will then be able to separate and break the bond between carbon 2 and carbon 3 and generate now a small acetyl-CoA molecule that could be used in the citric acid cycle. And what we have is now the fatty acyl-CoA molecule that has been shortened by two carbons. So therefore now you're looking at the carbonyl group that was in position 3 and the um, CH2 that was at position 4. So every molecule in a fatty acid, um, if you, like I said, if you have an 18 carbon fatty acid molecule, you can generate 9 acetyl CoA. So take the total number of carbon in the fatty acid molecule and divide by 2. So now, that means that for the generation of energy, any molecule that can eventually lead you to a uh, acetyl-CoA intermediate can be used in the citric acid cycle to generate reducing power in the form of NADH and FADH2. The other thing that I would like you to take out of this slide is, as I mentioned earlier, that the citric acid cycle is occurring within the mitochondria in the mitochondrial matrix. So now let's take a quick look at the citric acid cycle and the overview of the reactions, uh, of the general reactions that are going to happen. So what we have in the citric acid cycle is the input. The input is going to be an acetyl-CoA molecule having two carbons. You're going to add also ADP plus phosphate. You're going to use three NAD plus molecules and one FAD molecule. From the also the other molecule that is going to be inputted from the citric acid cycle itself is going to be a four carbon oxaloacetate. The basic reaction are going to involve the formation of a six carbon citrate molecule from the combination of the four carbon oxaloacetate and the two carbon acetyl-CoA and at the end of the cycle you're going to have the generation of two, the complete oxidation of the acetyl CoA molecule into two carbon dioxide molecule. You're going to have the generation of a GTP that through phosphate levels of through substrate level phosphorylation will become an ATP molecule, as well as the generation of three NADH molecules and one FADH2 molecule. So those are the major players. Now let's take a closer look at some of the reactions that are happening within the cell. Now, again, what we're going to see is that the Krebs cycle is composed of eight different steps. To facilitate understanding of these steps, what this image is illustrating are the number of carbons that are going to be uh, in each of the intermediate molecules, so it's not showing you the names of each of them. So one of the things that we can l uh, learn later are at least identify some of the names of them, but more importantly, just like we discussed with glycolysis, I do not want you to memorize the name of the enzymes that are going to be involved in the Krebs cycle, nor a lot of the intermediates. We'll be pointing that out to you. So what we have, again, it's the input of a 2-carbon acetyl-CoA that will combine with a 4-carbon oxaloacetate in step 1 to generate a 6-carbon citrate. Now, to a series of steps, what we're going to have is the initial decarboxylation in step 3 uh, of the 6-carbon molecule to generate a 5-carbon intermediate. But at the same time, we're going to have the don um, the reduction of NAD plus to NADH. So that will be the first NADH molecule generated in the cycle. At step four, we're going to have the subsequent decarboxylation of a five carbon intermediate again. So that will generate a four carbon intermediate and a carbon dioxide molecule, as well as the reduction of another NAD plus to NADH. 
between uh, a sub 5 we're going to have the first production of energy through phosphate to substrate level phosphorylation that is going to generate a GTP molecule and as you know GTP is also another high energy carrier here uh, in step 6 we're going to take another 4 carbon molecule and that molecule will be oxidized to donate two electrons to FAD to generate an FADH2 molecule. Eventually, through other reactions uh, at step 8, we are going to get another oxidation step where NAD plus will be reduced into NADH molecule and that will generate at step 8 the generation of another oxaloacetate that could be ready to begin the cycle anew. I have another slide that shows the names of every single one of the intermediates and their enzymes, but I know that you can actually find that on the book, and therefore I am going to um, forsake that slide for the moment. You, you will have it in your uh, slide list. But what I would like you to be more aware is at which of the steps shown in the graph over here are you having the decarboxylation events? the reduction of an NAD plus into NADH as well as the generation of a GTP molecule and the oxidation and the reduction excuse me of FAD into FADH2. One simple turn of the citric acid cycle will produce three NADH, one GTP and one FADH2 and that will release two carbon molecules. If the acetyl-CoA's are coming from glycolysis, that means that you will have two acetyl-CoA molecules generated from two pyruvate molecules and therefore the cycle will go around twice to generate six NADH, two GTPs and two FADH2 molecules and four carbon dioxide molecules. So this table 8.1 it's comparing the carbon dioxide molecules produced the amount of NAD plus molecules reduced to NADH and the amount of FAD molecules reduced to FADH plus in glycolysis, in the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA and in the citric acid cycle. What we can see um, by looking at the reaction one glucose molecule to two pyruvate molecules is a generation of zero CO2 molecules, two NADHs and no FADH2s. During the conversion and decarboxylation of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, we'll generate two CO2 molecules, two NADH molecules, but no FADH2 molecules. And through the citric acid cycle, we will have two uh, acetyl-CoAs going to four CO2s, so the cycle going twice. So therefore, we have four carbon dioxide molecules, since we started with two acetyl-CoA's and each acetyl-CoA has two carbons, we're going to have six NADH molecules and two FADH2 molecules. When we add these numbers together, from one six carbon glucose, we'll get six CO2 molecules, but we'll also get 10 NADH molecules and two FADH2 molecules. So as a question for you, how many ATPs and GTPs are produced from glycolysis and the citric acid cycle from all the steps when the glycolysis come in when the glucose molecules come in excuse me all the way down until they are completely oxidized into CO2 so how many ATP molecules are generated so now let's take a look at one of the movies provided by the uh, book that will explain the process in more detail Cells break down food molecules, such as glucose, through multi-step pathways. For example, in the process of glycolysis, breakdown of glucose molecules releases energy that is captured by the energy carrier molecules ATP and NADH. A breakdown intermediate, pyruvate, is imported into mitochondria, where it is converted into acetyl-CoA and fed into the citric acid cycle. Acetyl-CoA can also be generated by breakdown of fats or amino acids. In this circular reaction path of the citric acid cycle, carbon atoms are burned 
that is oxidized, and released one by one as the waste product carbon dioxide. In this way, energy is released stepwise and captured by energy carriers, including NADH. NADH funnels energy to the electron transport chain in the inner mitochondrial membrane. This fuels the proton gradient that is then used for the production of ATP, the cell's primary energy currency. The molecule that enters the citric acid cycle is the two-carbon compound acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA joins with the four-carbon oxaloacetate to create the six-carbon citrate. We'll track the carbons from acetyl-CoA with a red color. The two carbon atoms from oxaloacetate marked in blue will be released during this cycle to form carbon dioxide. In the next step of the cycle, citrate rearranges to form isocitrate. Note that the hydroxyl group is in a different position in these two molecules. In the next step, energy is captured by an NADH molecule, and a molecule of carbon dioxide is released. In this reaction, isocitrate is converted to alpha-ketoglutarate. The hydroxyl-bound carbon is stripped of its hydrogen atoms, resulting in a carbonyl group. One of these hydrogen atoms is picked up by NAD plus to form NADH, and another is released as a proton. The carbon and two oxygen atoms are then released as CO2, creating the five carbon alpha ketoglutarate. The next reaction also produces NADH and releases CO2. The alpha-ketoglutarate from the previous reaction is converted to succinyl-CoA by the addition of coenzyme A. The enzyme for this reaction adds a high-energy thioester bond to coenzyme A, releasing the carbon and two oxygen atoms and converting NAD plus to NADH. The next reaction releases enough energy to form GTP, an energy-carrying molecule related to ATP. In this reaction, succinyl-CoA is converted into succinate. The release of the coenzyme A group provides the energy to combine GDP and inorganic phosphate into GTP. Note that succinate is a symmetrical molecule. The two end carbons are chemically identical, and the two carbons in the middle are chemically identical. 
For convenience, we will continue tracing only the two carbons depicted in the upper half of the molecule. In the next step, a molecule of FADH2 is produced. FADH2, like NADH, is an energy carrier that feeds high-energy electrons to the electron transport chain. In this reaction, succinate is converted to fumarate. Hydrogen atoms from succinate are stripped off and donated to FAD to produce FADH2. In the next reaction, fumarate combines with a water molecule. The resulting molecule is malate, with the water molecule added across the two central carbons. The next step produces the final NADH molecule. In this reaction, malate is converted to oxaloacetate. The carbon carrying the hydroxyl group is converted to a carbonyl group. This reaction releases hydrogen atoms and converts NAD plus to NADH, releasing a proton, and producing the four carbon oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate is thus replenished and can take part in another cycle, returning to step one. Note the new position of the red carbon atoms, which originated from the acetyl-CoA in the previous cycle. In subsequent cycles, these carbons will eventually be lost as CO2. The green labels indicate the positions of the new carbons added during this new cycle. Now you have an introduction of the Krebs cycle and how a molecule of acetyl-CoA can combine with oxaloacetate to generate citrate and then by subsequent reactions that citrate molecule will be decarboxylated to generate four carbon intermediates as well as three molecules of NADH, one molecule of FADH2 and one GTP molecule. What we're going to look at now are the steps that led to the discovery of the Krebs cycle and how uh, the idea that it was actually a cycle and the intermediates used within that cycle were identified. So all of this begins with Hans Krebs, which was studying oxidation of different compounds in the early 30s. In his system back then, he was using samples from kidney or liver cells that were easily obtained from the butcher and therefore you can ask what substance is expected to be intermediate of the oxidation of food molecules. As a readout, these experiments look at the utilization of oxygen. Since the cells were looking at respiration and oxidation of food, they will measure then the utilization of oxygen and see the rate and the amount of oxygen being used. So Krebs had a hypothesis. Intermediate of metabolic breakdown of food, either the digestion, will be oxidized in the presence of kidney or liver cells, and that could then be measured by the amount of oxygen that was being used in the system. So then the part of that hypothesis will be that those intermediate compounds could be then identified to establish a biochemical pathway. As part of his work, he discovered that citrate, succinate, fumarate, and acetate were all oxidized to generate carbon dioxide. Another thing that they identify is that you required a continuous supply of oxygen to continue the oxidation of the molecules. One thing that I would like you to start to think is about why. If the citric acid cycle does not use oxygen, why is oxygen then required for the citric cycle to work? So let me repeat this question in a different way. So if oxygen is not utilized in the citric acid cycle, why have oxygen be the measured molecule to look at oxidation? So Krebs identify acetate, citrate, succinate, and funerate as intermediate uh, molecules in the citric acid cycle and also show that oxygen 
was required for oxidation. If you depleted oxygen concentrations, the oxidation of the molecules will decrease. So that was an interesting discovery. However, he didn't dis do this alone. In 1935, Albert Schent Georgi was working in a different system. He was using cell suspension of mins, pigeon breast cells, which are the cells used in flight muscle. And again, they were looking at these cells because they have a high rate of oxidation and they were also utilizing the measurement of oxygen as an indication for oxidation. What St. Georgi was able to discover is that the addition of four carbon compounds increased the amount of oxygen consumed in the experiments. So these four carbon compounds were succinate, fumarate, and malate. So the uptake of oxygen was much greater that could be obtained just by simple direct oxidation, and he called that catalytic stimulation. So the more succinate, fumarate, or malate that he added, the greater the consumption of oxygen. So other scientists contributed to the elucidation of the pathway. So Martius and Noob basically show the sequence of event that citrate would be converted into isocitrate, isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate, and alpha-ketoglutarate will be converted into succinate. St. Georgi showed that succinate could be computed, converted excuse me, to fumarate, fumarate to malate, and malate to oxaloacetate. What these data from these different groups indicated is that you have a linear pathway where citrate will be converted to isocitrate, isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate, alpha-ketoglutarate to succinate, succinate to fumarate, fumarate to malate, and malate to oxaloacetate. So those are the experiments that indicated the compounds of the citric acid cycle, but that still didn't indicate the nature of the relationship of these enzymes and these products to one another. So it was until much later that the inhibitor malonate was shown to give light. Malonate is a competitive inhibitor to succinate. As you can appreciate from this image, uh, the difference between malonate and succinate is just the presence of a CH2 group. So malonate could bind to the succinate dehydrogenase enzyme, preventing the generation of the FADH2 molecule and fumarate from succinate. So it's actually considered a poison. So let's see what are the experiments that uh, Krebs did to elucidate that the pathway was a cycle. So what Krebs did was to add malonate to men's liver tissues and see what will be the rate of oxidation. So when he added malonate to men's tissue, men's liver tissues, what he saw was a decrease in the amount of oxidation. Basically, that the consumption of oxygen has decreased significantly. Since they knew that malonate inhibited the enzyme succinate dehydrogenase, then they hypothesized that this enzyme must play a key role in cellular respiration. And this can be illustrated on the next slide. So on the next slide, what we can see are some of the um, experiments that they were done. Here you have the compounds of the citric acid cycle naming letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. The step from the succinate dehydrogenase blocked by malonate will be this transition from compound E, which is succinate, to compound F, which is fumarate. So now, in the upper part of the figure, if Krebs added malonate to the liver samples and then added also citrate, you will see the accumulation of succinate molecules because they understood that malonate was blocking the succinate dehydrogenase enzyme. The same will occur if any of the other molecules from the system were added. So if you added compound B, which is isocitrate, you will accumulate succinate. If you added alpha ketoglutarate, you still will accumulate succinate. So the question then was, check, 
what happens in the system when we add uh, melanate but instead of having adding citrate we now add fumarate if the pathway is linear you will get to molecule H which is oxaloacetate and the experiment basically show that if you added fumarate to kidney cells treated with malonate instead of accumulating oxaloacetate you will accumulate succinate again and that suggested that the reactions were happening in a cycle so when we look at the data one more time they said you know what if this is truly a cycle we can then take muscle cell suspensions and add oxaloacetate which is the very last uh, step that we believe is in the system and also add pyruvate and see what is produced so what they found was that if they added oxaloacetate and pyruvate that eventually you will generate citrate indicating that the initial step of the citric acid cycle was the association of an intermediate from pyruvate to generate citrate later when they understood that pyruvate could be decarboxylated into acetyl-CoA they understood that the molecule that will pair together with oxaloacetate was acetyl-CoA so a two carbon molecule with a four carbon molecule generating a six carbon citrate molecule another interesting uh, point in the oxidation of the pathway was the issue that if you can you can control the rate of respiration by adding substrates so for example if you add a moderate amount of pyruvate into this reaction you will get a low amount of oxygen consumption indicating that pyruvate eventually could uh, go through a couple of the cycles of the citric acid cycle and therefore have low oxygen consumption but if you had it and great excess of pyruvate to the system that will severely increase the output of the citric acid cycle increasing the amount of oxygen consumption so you had a dependence this was another experiment that was done that showed that replenishing the supply of any single intermediate will have a dramatic increase in the rate at which the entire cycle was operating after the cycle was elucidated they were able to show that the citric acid cycle it's actually an integral part of a very large cellular metabolic network and that that cellular metabolic network will bring different points of glycolysis and the citric acid cycle together with other reactions that will be required for the anabolic generation of other macro other molecules for example when we look at the citric acid cycle and glycolysis we can for example see that glucose 6-phosphate could be utilized to make nucleotides fructose 6-phosphate can be utilized to make amino acids uh, amino sugars glycolipids and glycoproteins dihydroacetone phosphate which is a product of the uh, linearization of fructose and cleavage of fructose 6-phosphate can be used in lipids 3-phosphoglycerate can be used to generate the amino acid serine phosphoenol pyruvate can be used to generate multiple amino acids and pyrimidines pyruvate can generate directly alanine so those are the portions in which glycolysis can contribute to other biochemical pathways to generate other molecules with the citric acid cycle we have that citrate can be used directly for the generation of cholesterol and fatty acids alpha ketoglutarate is an important intermediate in the generation of glutamate, amino acids, and purines. And succinyl-CoA, it's a molecule required for the generation of heme and chlorophyll. Last, we can see that oxaloacetate is an early intermediate in the generation of aspartate and other amino acids, as well as purines and pyrimidines. What you can see in this cellular metabolic network is that glycolysis and the citric acid cycle have multiple points, points of intercession between those systems and other biosynthetic pathways that can generate other molecules 
to finish the lecture, I am putting here a link that will have an overview of the mitochondria and the reactions that are happening in it. And this comes from Rice University. Well, thank you for listening to the lecture and I will see you on Friday.